Well, again, welcome everyone. We're glad you could be with us today, whether we're, you know, whether you're joining us live or delayed, or if you're watching an archive recording of today's message. Welcome to everyone. We're glad to have you. You know, we often talk about God's commandments. Jesus says that if we love him, we are to keep the commandments. The first John five verse three tells us, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. The English Standard Version reads, his commandments are not burdensome or difficult, basically. Let's go ahead, if you want, let's go ahead and turn over to Proverbs 29, verse 18. We'll get into this right away. It's Proverbs, chapter 29, and verse 18. You know, God's commandments are really not that difficult to follow, but they teach us how to live peaceably among each other and how to love God and each other, which is, of course, the two greatest commandments. God's commandments are a great benefit to us, and they will be a great benefit to all in God's coming kingdom. After all, God made us. Who better than He would know what's best for us? But what if we turn our backs to God's law? What about that? Look in Proverbs 9, verse 18. I'll be reading from the contemporary English version. Proverbs 29, 18 tells us, Without guidance from God, law and order disappear. But God blesses everyone who obeys His law. Today, people seem to be looking to God less and less for guidance. They ignore His commandments or even say they've been done away with. The world believes that man knows best how to take care of himself without God. I think we can all see how that's working out if we look around the world today. We see lawlessness increasing. We see criminals in large groups coming into stores, smashing display cases, and taking whatever they want. Then often they don't even run out of the store. They simply walk away. I suppose this is because it's become so commonplace today. It's almost beginning to seem normal. And that's the way the world is heading. Lawlessness. Proverbs 29.18 tells us, Without guidance from God... Law and order disappear. And that's really that's exactly what we're seeing today. On the other hand, Proverbs twenty nine eighteen also tells us, but God blesses everyone who obeys His law. God promises everyone blessings to keep His law. God blesses everyone who obeys His commandments. That's what He tells us. I know that all of us experience trials from time to time. I spoke a little bit about trials last week, I believe. But those who love and keep the commandments of God also receive many blessings. And if we think about it, our trials are a blessing too, because God often teaches us important lessons through our trials. You know, James 1 verse 2 tells us from the International Standard Version, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you are involved in various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But you must let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. We might not think of our trials as being a good thing, but they're preparing us, they are preparing us for God's kingdom, and that's certainly a good thing. Today I'd like to speak about our blessings, and are we truly thankful for our blessings? Or might we sometimes feel entitled to things. You know, some might get to the point where they feel like nothing is ever good enough for them. Uh, they sometimes seem to want more and more and really are never happy with what they have. They're never satisfied. So you know, maybe some of us really rarely think about our blessings. Or, as the hymn says, we might regularly count our blessings and name them one by one. If we invest the time to take an inventory of our blessings, I think we'll be counting for a very long time. But pause here just for a second. I'd like you to start to think about your own blessings from God, our blessings. What has He blessed us with? Think about the blessings we've been given. Now, I will mention a few I believe are common to probably all of us. But we all have, of course, many individual blessings as well. 
But if you think about it, we have an absolutely beautiful earth, do we not? There are beautiful landscapes all over the world. We have beautiful forests and meadows. We have majestic snow-covered mountains. There's a turquoise water of the oceans, beautiful sunsets. And some notice that the night sky can be a thing of great beauty. Although I know light pollution in many areas make viewing the night sky difficult, where we can still find dark skies, the moon, stars, the Milky Way, and the planets are beautiful. We had company here the other night, and they were amazed to see the planet Saturn and its rings in my small telescope. It was beautiful. It really was. And God not only created incredible plants that are good for food, that nourish us, but they also taste good, right? <laughs> we love to eat. And many are also very beautiful to look at. I think of things like roses, daisies, and all manner, actually, of beautifully colored plants that are pleasing to the eye. I like to watch sunflowers as they turn toward the sun as it moves in the sky. I think they're beautiful plants. And of course, are the animals. They're so wondrously made for their particular purpose and environment. And many, like plants, are very beautiful to look at. Deer come to mind, or maybe a peacock, which we have locally, <laughs> or a hummingbird. Have we ever just stopped and watched a hummingbird for a while? You know, there are hummingbird feeders that can be attached to the outside of a window. We did that. As we watch these hummingbirds right outside the window, they're fascinating to watch, and they are incredibly well-designed and beautiful. God has given us the beauty of His creation and the ability to see and appreciate that beauty. God's creation all around us is a blessing that we all share. Turn to Romans, if you would, Romans chapter 1. That's Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. I also believe that witnessing the beauty and the incredible design of God's creation should draw us closer to Him, our Creator. We might consider spending more time in nature. Perhaps we might visit a zoo to see and appreciate the different animals God's designed, or go through a flower garden. Uh, they're just beautiful. But witnessing God's creation all around us, I believe that should strengthen our faith and bring us even closer to God. I think it's very good for us. I know some of you will agree. Again, Romans 1, verse 20. Romans 1, verse 20. I'll be reading this in the English Standard Version. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they were, are without excuse. So here we're seeing that Seeing God's creation, no one should doubt that we have a truly great creator that created the world. So the people that don't believe that, well, they're without excuse. They should be able to see this and know. I think it's pretty plain. You know, in Genesis 1 verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Well, I certainly agree. God has given us a great earth to live on with abundant resources and beauty. And that in itself is a very great blessing. But, of course, there's more. God has given us our very lives. Without Him, none of us would even exist today. And He's given us our families and our loved ones. Aren't they a great blessing from God? Absolutely. All kind of things. We have all kind of blessings today. You know, we're even blessed with modern communications that allow us to converse with people even at great distances, as we are right now, I guess. You know, I communicate regularly with brethren in many different states as well as many other countries. Not sure you could add much more to this list. You're just giving you a few. But basically, everything, everything, the earth, its plants and animals, the night sky, our loved ones, even each one of us. God created everything, and all our blessings come from Him. And Revelation 4, verse 11 tells us, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. 
Well, I got my 36-year-old truck the other day. Yes, it's 36 years old, but it still looks good and still performs well. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it was hot outside, so I turned on the air conditioning. But I noticed the air coming out of the vents wasn't quite as cold as it should be. It was not warm, but it wasn't exactly cold. So I thought to myself, you know, I need to add some Freon to the air conditioning unit or take it to the shop and let them do it. But here we are, another problem. This is just ruining my day. Got something else I got to take care of, right? This is terrible. That's what I thought. But then I thought about what a blessing this old truck has been. With a camper on its back, it took our family on some great vacations where we spent some quality time together. Kentucky was hit by a great ice storm several years ago, and our new home lost power for over a week. It got to down to zero or just below. It was very cold. Well, roads were blocked with limbs and debris. This old truck and four-wheel drive got us to where we had some wood stored to kept us from getting really cold. Now, I thought to myself how this old truck has been a blessing to me over the many years. And even today, after 36 years, it just needs a little maintenance as all vehicles do. But rather than appreciate this blessing that this old truck's been, I caught myself forgetting about that and concentrating about the quite normal maintenance that it needed. As if this minor issue negated all the blessings of this vehicle. Sometimes I think we forget about the blessings we do have and concentrate only on the negative. Now, to most of us in the United States and in many other places, we've been greatly blessed with material things. Now, most of us have comfortable homes and vehicles. We have plenty of good food to eat. In fact, many of us have more trouble trying not to overeat than worrying about where our next meal will come from. But lots of material things are not necessarily blessings. When I was in Kenya, most of the people there had few material goods as we do here in the United States anyway. They seem to feel more blessed for what they have than most of us here in the United States. They're very happy people. But we have many blessings other than our material goods, and those are the important ones, actually. I'm sure if we stop and think for a moment, we can all think of many blessings we've had as a family and as individuals. If in our lives, if we count our many blessings and name them one by one, we might be at it for some time. By the way, we have a storm raging here. Hopefully we won't lose our... Yeah, we're being blessed by some rain, so if it lose connection, hopefully that won't happen. But uh, anyway, that's what's happening here right now. Let's go ahead. So uh, we'll have some blessings. We'll get the rain, right? Right. So think about blessings for a minute. Think about holding a newborn son or daughter, or perhaps a grandson or granddaughter, even a great-grandson or granddaughter. Our children are a blessing to us. Psalm 127, verse 3, contemporary English version tells us, Children are a blessing and a gift from the Lord. We have so many blessings today that we should be thankful for. We really do, but do we really stop and count our blessings? Do we ever do that? We know it's not just the blessings in this life that we have to be thankful for. We know that we have a very great gift from God. That gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It was quite a sacrifice he made for us. It was no small thing for Christ to suffer and die for us. In fact, let's go ahead and turn over to John 3.16, if you would. John chapter 3, verse 16. I think most of us have this verse memorized. This might be the most well-known and most often quoted verse in the Bible. I'm thinking it might be, but anyway, we probably know it, but let's take a look at that again. John 3, 16. It tells us, For God so loved the world. Now, that's us. That's everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life that we don't deserve. 
But due to the love of the Father and the Son, it's given as a gift to all that love and believe in them. And that is a huge blessing. And it's not just the great sacrifice they made for us that we might have the wonderful gift of eternal life. The incredible love of Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father is also a great blessing in and of itself. To be that loved. Can you imagine that kind of love for us? And it doesn't stop just there. It's not just their love for us. Remember that we were given the capacity to love God and to love each other. In fact, uh, research shows that the number one thing that makes us happy is our families and our relationships. And that's due to the love we have for each other. Love, both loving and being loved. That's what God is all about. And that's what God is using to create his great kingdom. So perhaps love is our single greatest blessing. It's responsible for so many positive things in our lives, including our salvation. Most people can appreciate God's beautiful creation. That's, of course, if they take the time to look. And I think most appreciate the love of their families and friends. But, brothers and sisters, we, the called out ones, have even greater blessings from God today than others have. Let's turn to Luke, if you would, Luke chapter 10 and verse 22. That's Luke chapter 10, verse 22. Now, up to this point, we've mainly been talking about the blessings that probably most people on the earth have today. But we, we have even greater blessings to be thankful for. Now, here in Luke 22, Jesus is speaking specifically to his disciples in private catch that in private. And remember that we are also Christ's disciples, okay? So what did he tell them here? And of course, by telling him this as disciples of Christ, he's telling us this as well. So again, Luke 10 verse 22, Jesus tells us, all things are delivered to me of my father, and no man knows who the son is, but the father, and who the father is, but the son. And he to whom the Son will reveal him. God has not been revealed to everyone just yet, nor has his actual plan been revealed to all. In fact, I know that most of us have tried to explain God's plan to our friends and family, but in most cases, it, it did no good, right? Why not? Well, it's because God and his true plan are not being revealed to everyone today. Now, at some point in the future, all that's all will come to know the true God and his real plan for man's salvation. But we, friends, we've been given the eyes to see and the ears to hear now. Verse 23. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately. Again, these words were his disciples. That's us, but not the world at large. Here's what he said. Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. So, brethren, we are very blessed indeed to have the knowledge and understanding that even the kings and prophets of the past have not had. And that's another great blessing we can count, another great blessing that we have. In fact, turn to Matthew chapter 13, if you would, to remind us, of, remind us of something. Matthew chapter 13, excuse me, verse 11. That's Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. We know that Jesus often spoke in parables. His disciples asked him why he spoke in parables. Now, what was his answer? Do we remember? Matthew 13, 11. He answered and said to them, because it is given to you, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Them meaning those who are not Christ's disciples, at least not yet. Okay. Verse 13. Therefore speak out to them in parables, because seeing they because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. 
So it's not God's plan to reveal everything to everyone at this point in time. And few today are actually blessed with the knowledge and the understanding that God's elect have. Few understand that our lost loved ones will one day know the Lord and that they will all be given the opportunity for eternal life. That's just something that the world doesn't really understand today. But that's some really good news for us. It's actually the gospel or the good news that Christ came to bring us. And this is another this is another wonderful blessing that God's people have today. It's certainly a great blessing to understand the deep love and mercy that God has for us all. You know, 2 Peter 3 verse 9 tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, meaning patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come through repentance. And that's something we should all be very thankful for. Indeed, we have many blessings to be thankful for. Let's turn to Deut- excuse me. <clears throat> Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. That's Deuteronomy chapter 28. We'll begin in verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now here are blessings we can choose to receive from God through our obedience to His commandments. I'll be reading this in the English Standard Version, by the way. And that's Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. Let's look at some blessings. But you might notice as I read this, the word if appears here or there. So notice that. It's a conditional. Okay, Deuteronomy 28, 1. And if, there's the first if, if and if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So next are some examples of the blessings God promises us if we obey his commandments. Verse 3, again the English Standard Version. He says, Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you and your barns and in all that you undertake. We certainly can use God's blessing on all that we do. We will certainly want that. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself. As he has sworn to you, if, again if, you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. And all the peoples of the earth shall see, <clears throat> shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity. That's not necessarily the prosperity gospel we hear, where we're abounding in you know extravagant homes and everything, but he'll make us prosper to where we're, our needs are taken care of. Let's try that again. Verse 11. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, and the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your livestock, and then the fruit of your ground, were in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. Verse 12. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. That last line. You know, one time the United States was fairly independent. We helped many other nations, and we were not deep in debt as we are today. We were prosperous without the need to borrow. I suppose we weren't satisfied with the blessings we had. I suppose we wanted even more. But today, we borrowed much from other nations, although I'm not sure this was necessary. I don't believe this will end well. Verse 13, let's go ahead. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, 
you shall only go up and not down. Well, that's good. But again, this is if we keep God's commandments. And for a while, I think the United States did. We know that the United States became the head of the world, you might say. They, were, you know, they went up. They were, the, they were the head and not the tail, certainly. But I wonder how much longer this will be the case. I'm not sure, because I don't think the United States uh, is following God uh, as a nation. But anyway, verse 13, let's do it, start again. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall only go up and not down if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Well, I believe the United States as a nation is turning aside from the words of God. We're even seeing the worship of false gods and goddesses increase. What should we then as a nation expect when we do this? The blessings? Well, if you read the rest of chapter 28, we'll see what God tells us will happen. If we do not obey the voice of the Lord our God and be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that he commands us. We might want to read the rest of this chapter later. We won't look at this today since our topic is blessings. But back to the blessings. God's people are certainly blessed, and we should be very thankful to God for our blessings. But speaking of thankful, what about the word thankful? Well, according to the Free Dictionary Online, thankful means to be aware and appreciative of a benefit, to be grateful or expressive of gratitude. What does the Bible have to say about gratitude or about being thankful for our blessings, maybe? What does the Bible say? When the King James, the word thank appears 27 times. The word thanks, the plural, appears 73 times. Thanksgiving actually appears 28 times. So without looking any further, some form of the word thanks appears at least 128 times in our King James Bibles. Should we be thankful? Well, I suppose that's a rhetorical question. Let's turn to Colossians. Let's turn to Colossians, if you would, chapter 3. It's Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. That's Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. So again, who are the people that God has revealed himself to at this time? Again, God's revealed himself, his true self, and his plan to his elect. Here in Colossians, Paul gives us instructions. He gives instructions to the elect. So these instructions are for us. Again, Colossians 3, verse 12. Here he says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, he's speaking to us, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, Meekness, long-suffering, or as the easy-to-read version puts it, God has chosen you and made you his holy people. He loves you. So your new life should be like this. Show mercy to others. Be kind, humble, gentle, and patient. Verse 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity, or love, which is the bond of per perfectness. And again, repeating in verse 14, this time in the easy-to-read version. Together with these things, the most important part of your new life is to love each other. Love is what holds everything together in perfect unity. Love. Verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be you Thankful. Be you thankful. Paul tells us to be thankful. Let's turn next over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. And here's another place where Paul tells us to be thankful. Here he tells us to be thankful for all things. In fact, he tells us to be thankful is the will of God. Again, that's 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. He says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 
God wants us to show our gratitude for our blessings. It's his will. We might take a note of this shortly because you might come back to this. Uh, it is his will for us to be thankful. Keep that in mind. And then let's turn to Psalm 107, if you would. It's Psalm 107, right there in verse 1. Psalm 107, verse 1. Let's take a look at what David says about being thankful. If we read through the Psalms, we'll find that God is being thanked at least 23 times. But again, Psalm 107, verse 1. Sounds like another hymn we were talking about. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And gathered them out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Well, here David tells us to give thanks unto the Lord. He tells us many times in the Psalms to give thanks. If you want us back up to chapter 92, that's Psalm 92. Read the first two verses, that's Psalm 92, the first two verses. So when's a good time to be thankful to God? In particular time? Well, it's always a good time to express our gratitude to God. I do that every day. But God's Sabbath is certainly a good time. Yeah, the Sabbath is time that God set aside for us when we can not only rest and be refreshed, but also time to give thanks and praise to God. Again, Psalm 92, verse 1. A psalm or song for the Sabbath day. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto your name, O Most High, to show forth your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. So what should we thank God for? Well, we talked about his beautiful creation of the earth, our very existence, the existence of our family and our loved ones, Christ's great sacrifice for us, the Father and Son's great love for us, and there are so many other things. In addition, you have some personal uh, things, I'm sure, that have happened along your way that you should be grateful for, so many blessings you've received from God individually. What about his law or his commandments? We talked about that earlier. You know, God's commandments aren't just something God uses to exert his authority over us. It's not for fun. His commandments are for our own good. You know, God is our creator, and he knows what's best for us. His commandments teach us how to live in peace and happiness with each other. There's that word if again, if we follow them, if we follow his commandments. But God's commandments are something we should be thankful for. They show us the path toward righteousness. That's something we don't naturally understand, it seems. Man's nature seems to run more to envy, jealousy, lust, and greed. As Proverbs 16, verse 25 tells us, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So God's commandments teach us to become more like him and prepare us for his coming great kingdom. So we should be very thankful to God for his guidance and his commandments. So that's something to be thankful for. What about answered prayers? We should certainly be thankful to God for them. That's for sure. And what about things like our food and our shelter? Well, again, ultimately everything comes from God. We should thank Him for everything and for all our blessings. Next, 1 Chronicles 16, if you would. That's 1 Chronicles chapter 16. We'll go to verse 1. It's 1 uh, Chronicles Chapter 16, we know that David was very thankful to God. We saw that earlier. You know, when David was king, he even appointed people 
to thank God continuously. That's right. Let's look at that. It's 1 Chronicles 16, verse 1. We'll start there. Now, here the ark was coming into the city of David. And, of course, David was king at that time. Let's pick up the story in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 1. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it, and they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. And when David had made an end of offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. They dealt to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to every one a loaf of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. But now, notice what David did in verse 4. He appointed Levites to perform certain duties, and one of those duties was to give thanks and praise to God. Verse 4. And he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. So David actually appointed priests to do this full time. That's how important it was. So we looked at some examples so far. What about our example in all things? Jesus Christ. Was he thankful? Let's turn to John chapter 11, if you would. John chapter 11 and verse 39. That's John chapter 11, verse 39. You may remember that is where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We'll pick up the story as Jesus arrived at Lazarus' tomb to resurrect him. Again, that's John chapter 11, verse 39. So Jesus is at the tomb. He says, Jesus said, Take you away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Said I not unto you that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. So here we see Jesus thank his heavenly Father. And like Jesus, we too should thank our heavenly Father for hearing our prayers. Next, if you would, Mark chapter 8, verse 1. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Now, this is where the multitude, numbering in the thousands, needed to be fed. They didn't have, <clears throat> excuse me, there didn't appear to be a nearly enough food to feed this many, but the small amount of food they were able to come up with just seemed to never run out. Of course, this was a miracle. But again, notice Jesus giving thanks to the Father in verse 6. Again, Mark 8, verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers or some of them came from far. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks. So again, we see Jesus giving thanks to his Father. Finishing verse 6, And break and gave to his disciples and set before them, and they did set them before the people. And it turned out, of course, everyone got to eat. Of course, we know that Jesus gave thanks to his Father at the last supper he had with his disciples. Let's take a look at that real quick. That's in Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 17 it is. Luke 22, verse 17. This is Luke's account of Jesus' last supper. And we know already probably before Jesus took the bread and the wine and he gave it to his disciples, he first gave thanks to the Father. Again, Luke 22, 17. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks, and break it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. So Jesus gave thanks, gave thanks to the Father, before he presented the bread and the wine to his disciples. So Jesus, our example, certainly 
gave thanks to the Father. So we should certainly give them thanks as well, don't you think? Well, I'd like to switch gears a little bit here. I'd like to add what research shows, and that is that being thankful in and of itself is a blessing. Being thankful is a blessing. Now, let's take a look at this. This is from an article from Psychology Today. The article is entitled, Seven Scientifically Proven Benefits of Gratitude, or Being Thankful. So let me read these two. There's seven. First, gratitude opens the door for more relationships. Not only does saying thank you constitute good manners, but showing appreciation can help you win new friends, according to a 2014 study published in Emotion. The study found that thanking a new acquaintance makes them more likely to seek an ongoing relationship. Okay. Second, gratitude improves physical health. Think about this one. Grateful people experience fewer aches and pains and report feeling healthier than other people, according to a 2012 study published in Personality and Individual Differences. So it can make us feel better. More health. That's always good. Number three, gratitude improves psychological health. So it's not just physical health, it's our well-being, our psychology, our psychological health. I'll read the article to you. I'll read this, this quote to you. Gratitude reduces a multitude of toxic emotions, from envy and resentment to frustration and regret. Robert Emmons, a leading gratitude researcher, has conducted multiple studies on the link between gratitude and well-being. His research confirms that gratitude effectively increases happiness and reduces depression. So giving thanks, uh, looking good here. Four, fourth one. Gratitude enhances empathy and reduces aggression. Grateful people are much more likely to behave in a pro-social manner even when others behave less kindly, according to a 2012 study by the University of Kentucky. Study participants who ranked higher on gratitude scales were less likely to retaliate against others, even when given negative feedback. So this is a good thing, right? Being grateful reduces hostility and aggression. Okay, verse, uh, or number five, not verse. This is the fifth on the list here from the website. It tells us that grateful people sleep better. Writing, I, I, I need that, don't I? Yeah. Writing in a gratitude journal improves sleep, according to a 2011 study, 2011 study, published in Applied Psychology, Health and Well-Being. Spend just 15 minutes jotting down a few grateful sentiments before bed, and you may sleep better and longer. Maybe I should start writing these down. Six, gratitude improves self-esteem. A 2014 study published in the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology found that gratitude increased athletes' self-esteem, an essential component of optimal performance. Other studies have shown that gratitude reduces social comparisons. Rather than becoming resentful toward people who have more money or better jobs, a major factor in reduced self-esteem, grateful, pe grateful people are able to appreciate other people's accomplishments. Think about that. I suppose that's true. And seventh, gratitude increases mental strength. For years, research has shown gratitude not only reduces stress, but it may also play a major role in overcoming trauma. A 2006 study published in Behavioral Research and Therapy found that Vietnam War veterans with higher levels of gratitude, experienced lower rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. A 2003 study published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology found that gratitude was a major contributor to resilience following the terrorist attacks on September 11th. Recognizing all that you have to be thankful for, even during the worst of times, fosters resilience. Wow. Who knew that, right? I didn't. Well, it turns out that being thankful itself has many blessings for us. We saw earlier that it is the will of God that are to be thankful for our blessings. And once again, God knows best. 
So I think we should follow our Savior, Jesus Christ, and keep the commandments and be thankful for our blessings. So to conclude today, we have much to be thankful for. The beautiful earth we live on, the food we've had, comfortable homes and vehicles, technology that allows us to stay in touch with others despite the often large distances involved. We should thank God for our very existence and the existence of all our friends and families. After all, God created us all. We should certainly be thankful that God sent his son to be sacrificed for us. We should be very thankful that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins, allowing us to have eternal life in his kingdom. We should be thankful for the love that our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ have for us, the great love, and for the love we have for each other. That may be the greatest uh, blessing of all. But we have so many blessings to be thankful for. We just need to remember them sometimes. You know, many today just do not comprehend what God actually has in store for all of us. That great future that lies ahead to all of us. What a great blessing it is to be one of God's elect. One who is given understanding that most do not have as of now. Understanding that shows us that God has a plan for us that most are unaware of. A plan that shows God's great love and mercy for us all. And an understanding that brings us ever closer to God. We have so, so many blessings to be thankful for. We saw that Paul tells us to be thankful. David tells us to be thankful. In fact, he appointed some of the Levites to constantly give thanks to God. We saw our example, Christ himself, give thanks to the Father on numerous occasions, and there are more than that. I just gave you three. But we today have so many blessings, with even more promised in the coming future. We really need to pause at some point and count our blessings. Name them one by one. But like I said, it might take us a while. For our last scripture, and to end today, let's turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. That's Philippians 4, verse 4. Philippians 4, 4. As always, Paul has some very good advice and encouraging words for us. We might note when we get to verse 6 that Paul says we should have thankful hearts. Again, Philippians 4 verse 4. I'll be reading this from the contemporary English version. Philippians 4 4 says, Always be glad because of the Lord. I'll say it again. Be glad. Always be gentle with others. The Lord will soon be here. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. With thankful hearts, offer up your prayers and requests to God. And particularly note verse 7. Then, because you belong to Christ Jesus, God will bless you with peace that no one can completely understand. And this peace will control the way you think and feel. Dear brothers and sisters, we, particularly as true fathers of Jesus Christ, as His very elect, are greatly blessed. Let us never forget our many great blessings. Blessings that all come from God. Let us never fail to give Him our great thanks and our praise.